2022 was a historic year for the Pokemon franchise, but probably not for the reasons that you'd think. It has nothing to do with Scarlet and Violet, Ash Ketchum becoming a world champion, or Legends Arceus. Wait, that was only a year ago? Jeez, these games come out way too fast. Rather, 2022 was the first year since 1997 where not a single spin-off game was released. But to me, this didn't come as a surprise, rather as an inevitability. If you're a fan of this channel, then you're probably familiar with my What Happened To series, a series that has a concerning amount of videos dedicated to discussing forgotten spin-off games. Long gone were the days where Pokemon spin-offs were a long-running series that would release at a rate comparable to the core series. But why did this happen? Why were Pokemon spin-off games so popular in the mid-2000s and are now all but gone today? But to understand where Pokemon spin-offs went, first we have to understand where they came from. Now, I'm not an industry insider or a game developer, so this is all purely speculative, but using my knowledge on how basic marketing and collaborations work, I can assume that it probably goes something like this. Chunsoft wants to make another Mystery Dungeon style game. But boss, one of the employees says, The last time we made a Mystery Dungeon game, it sold 12 copies and we had to lay off half the workers and eat grass for three months. The boss says, hmm you have a point. And then he dials up the Pokemon company to ask for the rights to use their branding and characters in the game. Both companies know that if the game simply has the Pokemon logo on it, it will likely sell at least a million copies, and they can both make good money. So Chunsoft ends up doing all the dev work, and all the Pokemon company has to do is publish the game, and they take home a good chunk of the profits. And so, Pokemon Mystery Dungeon is born. It's a simple yet effective way for both companies to get what they want. And of course, as other game studios caught wind of this, it's no secret why the Pokemon Company was giving out more blessings than the Pope. So you end up with Stadium, Hey You Pikachu, Snap, Pinball, Troze, Coliseum, Battle Revolution, Ranger, Poke Park, and so on and so forth. Which leads me to reason number one why the spin-offs may have declined. Simple oversaturation. And often not so good games. You see, the bulk of these titles I would say were released in the window from 2004 to about 2014. And despite the Pokemania of the 1990s largely subsiding, these spin-off titles still managed to put up respectable sales numbers. In the beginning, at least. Coliseum? Over 2 million sales. Ranger? Almost 3 million. Mystery Dungeon? Nearly 6 million at the series peak. Well, they did have three versions, so they kind of cheated. But the problem is, that's a lot of money for most consumers to be dropping on Pokemon games on a yearly basis, especially when these games typically didn't have the same widespread appeal as the main series. For every person like me who loves Mystery Dungeon and Coliseum, I guarantee you there's someone else who hates them. Maybe you might be one of them. Some people can't stand the repetitive gameplay of dungeon crawlers or the constant action of drawing loops on your DS. I've had carpal tunnel since 2006. Hey, get off the screen, I'm cooking right now. So in the beginning, most Pokemon fans probably picked up most or all of these different games, decided that at least half of them weren't very entertaining and never bothered to buy the sequels. Not to mention, a lot of these titles felt like they were being made for a quick buck and not to actually make a quality game. Like Pokemon Dash. Look, I know there are diehard Pokemon Rumble fans out there, and not to disrespect you guys or anything, but is this really what you think of when you think of a quality video game? So it's no wonder why most people wisened up and said, hey, maybe we shouldn't be blowing hundreds of dollars a year on three to four mediocre video games that just so happen to have Pokemon branding on them. I know this may be hard to hear, since a lot of these games are deeply nostalgic and close to our hearts, but trust me, Mystery Dungeon was an outlier. It's not the standard of quality. And even that series wasn't consistent the whole way through. Does anybody remember the WiiWare games? Okay, probably not because they didn't release outside Japan, but they existed! So naturally, people became more wary of buying anything with the Pokemon logo on it, and we can see this with virtually every single spin-off series having a massive decline in sales by the time 2014 rolled around. Even when the game was actually good, like Pokemon Conquest, the stigma against Pokemon spin-offs at that point in time was simply too high to overcome. Reason number two, they became obsolete. The easiest example of this is the 3D battle sim games, like Stadium, Coliseum, XD, and Battle Revolution. There isn't really a purpose for a 3D battle simulator anymore, because guess what? All these games are in 3D now. And I know people will say, but Game Freak's battles look terrible compared to those games. Yeah, I agree, but we're in the minority here. 95% of the Pokemon fanbase is not going to be sold by a Pokemon Battle Revolution HD with better models and animations. And I don't care if your tweet saying Pokemon Coliseum needs to be remade on the Switch got 5,000 likes. Twitter is an echo chamber designed to make insane people think their small opinions are more important than they really are. In the real world, nobody is asking for this. 
It's kind of like how Sony got gaslit into re-releasing Morbius in theaters and still nobody went to see it. Okay, maybe it's not that extreme, but it's close. Anyway, how did I get here? Oh yeah, 3D Battle Sims. They're not coming back. The Nintendo Online Service is the best thing you're getting. Another way some spin-off games became obsolete is because they were designed with one console in mind. Pokemon Ranger is probably the best example of this, and I also mentioned this in its What Happened To video a couple years ago. The entire premise of that series is built on drawing circles with your DS stylus. It's a cool idea for 2005, well, kinda. But after the new console smell wore off and the 3DS came in, there was no longer a reason for Ranger to exist. Troze is another example, clearly just designed as a regular Troze-themed game for the DS, it made a somewhat discreet return to the 3DS many years later, and eventually it was just rebranded into Pokemon Shuffle for mobile phones because it had way more potential for success there than any of the handheld Nintendo consoles. Same with Poke Park, but maybe to a lesser degree. I don't think this series ever had any ambitions of going beyond the Wii. I fully think it was just trying to capitalize on the massive sales of the console and the fact that besides Battle Revolution, there wasn't a major Pokemon title on the system. The moment those Wii U sales numbers came out, they probably pulled the plug on any ideas for a third game. That and the developer creatures became much more involved in the production of the core series game since they've done almost all of the model work from X and Y onward. It was probably more worthwhile for them to pour their efforts into that rather than continue a spin-off series with meager sales. There, I just gave you your what happened to Poke Park video in a single paragraph, please stop asking me now. But yeah, with the DS and the Wii being two of Nintendo's most monumental console releases ever, of course a lot of game developers would want to ride off of Pokemon's coattails for a few extra bucks. With the Wii U and 3DS being substantially less popular, naturally the developers were going to be way less interested. And while the Switch has now surpassed the Wii in lifetime sales, there's one new huge barrier that still keeps most spin-off titles off the console. Reason number three, and probably the biggest one, the rise of mobile gaming. In the mid-2010s, Pokemon was one of Nintendo's first franchises to really embrace the new wave of mobile gaming. Pokemon Shuffle and Pokemon Rumble World were the first signs that the apocalypse was coming. Pokemon Shuffle, released for mobile devices, was leagues more popular than any of the previous Troze entries in the series, being downloaded nearly 7 million times. As for Pokemon Rumble World, this was actually a 3DS game rather than a true mobile game, but boy it sure functioned like one, essentially being free to play but with microtransactions built in to let you speed up your progress. This is your legacy, Pokemon Rumble fans, just remember this. For the most part, these early Pokemon mobile games were complete throwaways, and I'm deeply sorry if you ever spent your hard-earned money on them. Perhaps the most interesting case study comes from Pokemon Duel. The game was released in 2016 and received constant updates for more than three years. It managed to crack 40 million downloads, and that's despite the game never being released in many European countries. I'm genuinely surprised at these numbers because I never actually knew a person who played Pokemon Duel. Not even myself. The game generated over 20 million dollars, money that most spin-off titles would kill for, before being inexplicably shut down in October 2019. Everything those players built up or spent money on, gone in the blink of an eye. But Pokemon Duel was largely overshadowed by the other Pokemon mobile game of 2016, the global phenomenon known as Pokemon Go. Pokemon Go has influenced the Pokemon series in many ways, and honestly, that might be a video in itself one day. But for this video, just know that its success really ramped up the production of other Pokemon spin-off games for mobile. And I know what you might be thinking, Pokemon Go was a fad, it was only popular for two months and then lost 80% of its player base. Sure, but it still made nearly a billion dollars in that year alone. And then 2019 and 2020, it somehow made even more. 2022 was Pokemon Go's worst year by far, but it still generated $430 million. Contrary to popular belief, this game is far from dead. And every other game studio took note. Just for reference, here's every spin-off game released on console from 2016 that doesn't have a free-to-play model. Pokémon Tournament, Detective Pikachu, Mystery Dungeon DX, and New Pokémon Snap. That's it, that's a grand total of four games in seven years. Meanwhile, on mobile or free to play, Pokemon Duel, Pokemon Go, Pokemon Playhouse, Pokemon Quest, Pokemon Rumble Rush, Pokemon Masters, Pokemon Smile, Pokemon Cafe Mix, and Pokemon Unite. And herein lies the problem. Rather than releasing full quality games, many developers have figured out the best ways to squeeze your wallet dry with the bare minimum amount of effort. Remember Genius Sonority, the brilliant studio that made Pokemon Coliseum, XD, and Battle Revolution with almost no prior knowledge of Pokemon beforehand? Well, they're making Pokemon Cafe Remix now. And to be clear, this isn't a shot at them, they're just doing what's most profitable. 
It's more of a demonstration that these same studios still exist and still make Pokemon related products, just ones that are a lot different than they used to be. Now, this is more of a gaming industry as a whole problem than a Pokemon specific problem, but Pokemon has certainly been one of the most noticeably affected by it. Now, I'm not here to say all mobile games are greedy and evil. I, for one, actually really like Pokemon Masters EX. Although, I am dreading the day that the servers inevitably go offline and I have nothing else to do with my virtual collection of trainers. And I also enjoyed Pokemon Go, despite its many, many faults. At least until I graduated from college and started working a 9-to-5 job in the middle of nowhere, and that's when I realized the game no longer had anything to offer me. And contrary to what you might have thought at the beginning of this video, there isn't a shortage of Pokemon spin-off content right now. Although 2022 didn't have a wholly new game, it had plenty of updates and new releases for pre-existing mobile games. It's not like there's less to play now than there was in the past, it's actually quite the opposite. But it all feels a little... hollow. Like, there is no Pokemon Coliseum or Mystery Dungeon to pass down to my hypothetical kids one day. Okay, I know this sounds goofy, but bear with me. I know you could argue those old games weren't anything amazing, they were just marketing tools to keep Pokemon in the public eye while Game Freak made the games that we were actually excited for, but some of those games still felt like they had importance or soul to them. They took us to places that the core series games would never dare to go to. A world filled with talking Pokemon with a crisis of time being stopped. A grungy, dark world inhabited by gangsters and thugs who turn Pokemon evil for profit. A game set in the ancient past with many Japanese themes, and... Oh wait, I guess the core series actually did end up doing that. And I know I'm gonna get comments on this because people consider Legends Arceus a spin-off for some reason, but... It just isn't. <laughs> That's not how it works. Just because a game doesn't have gym badges doesn't mean it's not a main series game. That's like saying Alola is a spin-off. It's just dumb. Please don't be that guy. But at any rate, thank you for watching my video. If you enjoyed, be sure to leave a like and subscribe if you haven't already. And as always, a big shout out to my channel members for the support. I'll see you guys next time.